The title of this lecture is The Intersection of Personal Faith and Compositional Craft in Selected Choral Works of Michael Praetorius. Biographical and musical evidence drawn from the life and works of Michael Praetorius strongly suggests that he was not only a religious man, but also possessed a deep personal Christian faith. That this faith influenced both his scholarly writings and his music is evident from analysis of the following works. One, his commentary on the liturgy of the Lutheran Mass and Psalmody in the first volume of Syntagma Musicum. Two, his Psalm 116 setting, Das ist mir lieb. And three, two Lutheran Mass settings appearing in the Polyhymnia Caduceatrix et Panegyrica, Isaiah de Propheten and Olam Gottes Anschuldig. 2021 marks the 400th anniversary of the death of Michael Praetorius on February 15, 1621. He was born on February 15, 1571 in Kreuzberg, Germany, and died at Wolfenbüttel, Germany, on either his 49th or 50th birthday. As a composer, organist, theologian, and music theorist active during the time of the Protestant Reformation, he had a tremendous impact on Lutheran worship during his lifetime and beyond. As a bridge composer between the late Renaissance and early Baroque, Praetorius composed works that represent various compositional styles. The Italian-German imitative style, the homophonic chorale harmonization style, the Italian polychoral style, and the chorale concerto style. He is known to have composed over 1,200 musical works, many of which appear in the 16 volumes of Musée Zionnet, hymn harmonizations in imitative settings, the 15 volumes of Polyhymnia, Motets, choral concertos, and polychoral works, and the nine volumes of instrumental dance music. Praetorius was raised and trained to be a theologian, and he was always regretful of the fact that he never became one. However, we find that he actually did serve as a theologian in regard to Christian worship. Praetorius scholar Dr. Margaret Boudreau asserts that he was passionate about his faith and attempted to fulfill his desire to be a pastor through his role as a church music leader. She explains, Creating, performing, teaching, and publishing treatises on music became the platform upon which Praetorius could pursue his pastoral zeal as well as express his deeply held personal piety. The nature of this faith may be deduced from several pieces of evidence that will be presented in this lecture. Praetorius was the third son of Michael Schulze. Schulze was the family name. The name Praetorius is the Latinized version of Schulze, meaning magistrate. Michael was both the father's and the son's name. Praetorius had a rich heritage in the Lutheran faith, which is key to his upbringing. His father, a pastor, was trained by Martin Luther himself in Wittenberg, the birthplace of the Reformation. His two older brothers were also pastors. His brother Andreas was a professor of theology at the famed Viadrina am Frankfurt Oder University. The Schulze family was connected to Johann Walter, who was Martin Luther's musical assistant, collaborating with him in writing the music for the Lutheran German Mass. Walter was a colleague of Michael's father. Both men had taught at the Latin school in Torgau. In 1573, the family moved from Kreuzberg to Torgau. Michael attended the Latin school and was taught music by Michael Voigt, who was Johann Walter's successor and formal, former pupil. A report by a classmate claimed that this cantor, Michael Voigt, had instilled a great interest in music in his students. When Praetorius was somewhere between 12 and 15 years old, he went to live with Andreas in Frankfurt so he could begin a course of study in theology at the Viadrina. During this time in Frankfurt, he began the study of organ, but before that time was mostly self-taught, receiving no professional training. In later years, Praetorius regretted that he hadn't advanced his musical skills in his early years, for which he had to compensate in his working career. It is unknown if this was due to a lack of opportunity or to his own choices. During his studies in 1587, his brother Andreas passed away. As a result, Michael had to support himself. He took a position as organist for the Marienkirche in Frankfurt and stayed for three years, leaving for unknown reasons. It is suggested that he likely continued his theology studies at that time in Helmstedt in 1589. In 1595, at 24 years of age, he entered the service of Duke Heinrich Julius of Brunswick Wolfenbüttel as organist. He was promoted to Kapellmeister in 1604. Duke Heinrich Julius was known to love and support the arts. In 1603, Praetorius married Anna Lachamacher and they had two sons together. 
During these years at Wolfenbüttel, he composed the nine parts of the Musée CNA in the German Protestant chorale style, as well as song, as well as Latin songs, motets, and liturgical forms. In 1613, Duke Julius died. His son and successor, Duke Friedrich Ulrich, did not value either Praetorius or his music. The funding for music was decreased. The Wolfenbüttel musical forces became smaller and salaries were reduced. The choir at the Wolfenbüttel court started to deteriorate. As a result, Praetorius traveled to and worked at other German courts and churches that provided more support for musical forces. As he continued in writing, preparing, and performing music for Lutheran worship services and festivals, during the seven years between the death of Heinrich Hulis and Praetorius's own death, the composer spent two and a half years in Dresden, where he became increasingly familiar with the new Italian concerto style. In Dresden, he worked with Heinrich Schütz, who had studied this style with Giovanni Gabrielli in Italy. This led to a new, new phase in Praetorius's compositional career, as he began writing a number of large works that incorporated several distinct stylistic elements traditional 16th century counterpoint in the style of lasso, Lutheran chorales, and the polychoral concerto style, he helped establish a new type of work, the chorale cantata, also referred to as chorale concerto, and published a number of these cantatas, which are included in his collection, Polyhymnia Caduciatrix et Panegyrica. Two of the three works that will be discussed and performed as part of this lecture recital are from this collection. During his last years, Praetorius also prepared and led church music in Kassel and Magdeburg and visited Leipzig, Nuremberg, and Bayreuth with Schutz and Scheidt in 1619. In 1620, he returned to Wolfenbüttel, but his appointment as Kapellmeister was not renewed. He died shortly thereafter due to ill health or possibly because he was overworked. When he passed away, Praetorius was well known. He was buried at the Heinrichstadt Church. He left instructions that most of his wealth should be set up in a foundation to help the poor. Arno Forscher notes that this act was a beautiful testimony to the selflessness and goodwill he had demonstrated for a lifetime. Much of Praetorius' compositional outfit, output was composed to enhance Lutheran worship. Luther died only 25 years prior to Praetorius' birth, and the order and conduct of worship in the evangelical church was still coalescing during Praetorius' lifetime. The widespread introduction of the German language into worship services was essential to the Lutheran expression of faith. Because of the printing press, there were now opportunities for more participation of the laity in understanding the services, as well as in worshiping and preaching. The Bible, its doctrines, ideas on faith, and songs of worship were now accessible to the common person. The very first Lutheran songbook, Johann Walter's Eichliche Songbuchlein of 1524, was in the style of the traditional Roman Catholic polyphonic motet. The tenor melody was in long notes that were occasionally broken up into short figures, and the other voices moved freely above and below it with more motion. But the age of the German chorale had arrived. For a clarification, the term chorale has two meanings. The first is a hymn or song sung to a traditional or composed melody in church, and the second is a harmonization of a chorale melody. These earliest chorales, the first definition, set mostly by Luther and Walter, were texts set to one-line melodies and derived from two main sources, the chants and hymns of the Catholic Church and the pre-Reformation, predominantly German religious songs. The Catholic chants and hymns were translated into German, or the tunes were incorporated into chorales. Sometimes only the old text was used and was given a new melody, or the old tune was altered to the point of not being recognized. These new songs had irregular meter and modal melodies. Tonic and dominant harmonies were not common or familiar. The inflection of the text didn't always fit well with the melodies. What was important, however, was the message and the use of the German language. For example, three chants translated by Luther were Veni Redemptor Genitum, which became Nun kam der Heiden Heiland, Asolis Oratis Cardine, which became Christum Versolen Loben Schön, and Veni Creator Spiritus, which became Komm Gott Schöpfer Heiliger Geist. After an initial period, however, the chorales took on a life of their own and were not based on or connected to the Roman Catholic chants. In 1524, many Lutheran songbooks were in use in various German cities. 
Christopher Boyd Brown estimates that there were more than two, two million hymnals, song sheets, and other hymn-related materials circulating in 16th century Germany. Pretorius not only harmonized these chorale tunes for the congregation, but also created more elaborate settings for the choir or for the combined choir and congregation. As in the Roman Catholic tradition, trained choirs provided music for the Lutheran worship services. However, the Lutherans also encouraged congregational singing. German texted songs were needed for the services for, for both choir and congregation. Luther created both Latin and German versions of the traditional mass texts that, were, that reflected his new theological teachings, the Formulae Nice in Latin in 1523, and then three years later, in 1526, the Deutsche Messe in German. Although there were distinct differences in the Reformational doctrine, the Formula Messe was similar to the Roman Catholic Mass. The Mass ordinary movements in the Deutsche Messe were often replaced with substitute chorales, which were expansions of the original Latin versions. Wir glauben all an einen Gott replaced the Credo. Jesaja den Propheten replaced the Sanctus. And Christe du Lang Gottes, or O Lang Gottes Entschuldig, was substituted for the Agnus Dei. However, the usage of Latin remained in the services for quite some time, even in the Deutsche Messe. Luther was not trying to do away completely with Latin, nor was he insisting that the churches use his liturgy. These new liturgical forms were offered as a framework to be adjusted. Luther's guidelines were quite flexible. Every service may be held entirely in Latin or German, which included several other flexible practices. This very tradition in the Lutheran regions lasted in Germany for many years after. In formulating music for German Lutheran worship, Praetorius played an important role in its development. He provided many settings and harmonizations in both Latin and German, and was an important force encouraging and incorporating congregational worship. The boy choirs were trained in Latin schools by Kapellmeisters who provided and prepared the service music. Praetorius's methods of congregational involvement use alternation, including the organ, choir, and congregation, and sometimes joining these forces together. Praetorius united the figural polyphonic music of the choir with the core leader, unison on melody, music of the congregation. Praetorius was the earliest, or among the earliest, composers who incorporated the organ with the congregational singing and the choir. He provided music for the services with beautiful, expressive, and artistic settings for the choir, yet he also developed the involvement of the congregation in these works. Praetorius played an important role in popularizing a new style of German sacred music in which the melody appeared in the soprano voice with the lower parts harmonized in a similar rhythm. These pieces were called cantonals. Lucas Osiander is credited with being the first to publish a volume using this style in 1586, Wuppzig Geistliche Lieder und Salmen. Praetorius is important in popularizing the style by providing around 750 accessible chorales in various forms. Leonora Wagner states that his output of cantonals is so vast that they form a complete hymn book for the 17th century Lutheran choir to use in accompanying congregational singing. Gregory Johnson has noted, in contrasting the music of Schütz and Praetorius, Schütz music rarely involves a congregation on a participatory level. This development to tune in the top voice has spiritual implications as well. The melodies and the more metered rhythms were more energetic than chant and more easily remembered. Now the common person could sing the songs of faith in their homes and be edified by them. In the preface of this musical Musée Zionet collection, Praetorius offers that the purpose of this new style was so the songs could be used as a type of Christian devotional. He explained, I therefore hope that these German psalms and songs, whose texts and melodies are familiar even to small children, scored in this way, might perhaps be just as agreeable to a few people as the Latin ones, especially since the chorale melody, which is usually in the soprano part, can be easily and intelligibly heard and detected above the other parts, and can be imitated by each person when singing by himself after his devotion. Additionally, in the same preface, he describes the effect of these melodies. Choral melody pricks up the ears and focuses their attention on the Word of God, giving contemplation to the mind, emotion, and firm devotion to the heart. In his work at the various churches and courts, Praetorius arranged and adapted his compositions to specifically suit the musical forces and traditions at each location, both large and small. 
In his collection of German hymns and chorales, he labels seven different regions in Germany above a, music, above a musical score to represent the location for which each particular arrangement was specially written. In his dedicatory epistle from Musee ZNA 5, a collection of hundreds of sacred works in German and Latin, he wrote, since the melodies for many psalms and songs are also sometimes dissimilar and different in different countries and cities, I have likewise not let this escape my notice entirely. Insofar as I might have been aware of them, I subjoined and added the harmony of every location in the confidence that, as each location might have opportunity to use them, this will not prove disagreeable to pious Christians. This shows his adaptability and desire to create and share accessible music for worship services. Pretorius reveals that he is truly knowledgeable both as a musician and as a theologian in his document Syntagma Musicum I or Musae Artis Analecta. This extensive musical treatise presents evidence relevant to the understanding of his faith. He provides a commentary and discourse on the Lutheran liturgy, providing background and justification for each of the many spoken and sung liturgical elements. In another section, he gives a teaching on the benefits and usage of singing the psalms, which includes a historical narrative on responsorial psalmody. Because Syntagma Musicum I is often described as a theological treatise and not as a musical treatise, it has received little attention from, from music scholars. The article on Praetorius in New Groves states, the first volume of Syntagma Musicum deals with religious music, its principles, and its liturgical constituents. It is of real value only in its wealth of quotations from every period. David Fleming, the first English translator of Syntagma Musicum I, further referred to as SM1, noted the repetition and persistence of the Christian theme in the document. He states, it is a mistake to view Praetorius's discussion of psalmody as purely descriptive or analytical. There is a strong undercurrent of propaganda in every chapter. Through this statement, Fleming implies that Praetorius designed this document as a tool of evangelism. In consideration of Praetorius's other fervent prayers, devotional thoughts, and zealous commentary, this inference is well founded. Researchers have suggested other possible motivations for the creation of SM1. The first is that it was a reaction to the reformers of John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli and their followers who did not allow musical instruments in the church. Calvin's argument asserted that instrumental music inflames the passions and thus should be banned. Zwingli had removed all instrumental music in the churches in Zurich by 1525, and a generation later, Calvin allowed only unaccompanied unison metrical psalmody to be sung by the congregation in Reformed churches. Praetorius states his disapproval of this teaching and practice, strongly disagreeing with their intention to limit and exclude purely musical expression from worship. Robin Lever additionally suggests another possible purpose for the writing of the SM1. It was to support the Lutheran reformers in their effort to completely separate from the Roman Catholic Church. He says, for some reformers, the new awareness of biblical doctrine, together with the perception of the shortcomings of the contemporary church in the light of this doctrine, led them to conclude that the Reformation must mean a complete break with everything that the Church of Rome stood for, especially with its liturgy and music. Another possible reason for Praetorius to write SM1 may be suggested. The treatise presents both Praetorius's justification of sacred polyphonic music and his justification of the role played by the music director in the performance of sacred music. He gives a biblical and historical narrative on worship music, defending his points with evidence from both the Bible and from the teachings of the early church fathers. He compares the works of the Levites in the Old Testament temple to the work of the Lutheran Kapellmeister. He states, I pray with devout prayers that he may keep the practice of religion safe and intact, and that with his grace and inspiration, you pursuing the goal before you with untiring zeal, unbroken constancy, and unconquerable piety, may defend the dignity of Lutheran practice, sorry, may defend the dignity of liturgical practice, extend its use, and as is fitting, that you may vigorously build the zeal of the church for, his, for its exercise in faithfulness to your duty, both in speed and against the despoilers and destroyers of organs and choirs. In the statement, he promotes, he promotes the worship of God, which is offered through music in the church. His thoughts and statements give support to church music leaders, instilling confidence by defending and justifying their role 
and encouraging them to perform their duties with boldness. He has much to say about sacred vocal and instrumental music because his passion is to promote the worship of God. The message to church music directors is clear. You are performing a divine service. Work with confidence, recognizing the importance of your work. The theme of concio et cantio is prevalent in this treatise. The, the terms have been loosely translated by scholars as speech and song, but the meaning to Praetorius was much deeper and more meaningful. Concio refers not just to any spoken word, but to the proclamation of the very words of God, which includes the scripture and its teachings and the gospel me message with its powerful implication to transform humanity. Cantio refers to the singing of words of worship and biblical doctrinal truth and the musical expression that is devoted to God. The true essence of concio and cantio is that the spoken word in the church runs parallel to the music in the church and that both are truly valuable. Because the sacred words and prayers of response are of great importance to Praetorius, the musical settings which carry these words are therefore also important to him. His artistic and creative works reveal that he ascribes great value to them. He believes that the musical settings provide depth and insight to the sacred texts, and that the harmonies, rhythms, and text painting invite hearers to dwell on the words, which drives the message more deeply into the heart. Praetorius uses musical text repetition to stress the importance of specific texts, giving a highlight or emphasis which prolongs and deepens reflection. Regarding the liturgy, Praetorius provides historical justification for the exercise of public Christian worship by naming several ancient church leaders who were defenders and supporters of Christian liturgy and crediting each with specific contributions. Additionally, he teaches that practicing the liturgy causes others to have a good impression of Christianity. Well, whatever is performed here with voices and instruments spreads the good repute of God, lives by confessing the sincerity of the Christian religion, and shows the true worship of God by supplication and praise. End quote. He cites the Apostle Paul's exhortation regarding the practice of the liturgy, advising his readers and reminding them that they should quote, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing and making music from your hearts to the Lord. End quote and to, quote, teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts, end quote. Regarding psalmody, regarding psalmody, or singing the psalms, Praetorius gives a defense in SM1 that compares to his defense of a liturgy. He provides a history of antiphonal psalmody, or alternation in the singing, tracing it back to Old Testament days and the psalm of ascents, Numbers 120 through 134, which were written in antiphonal style. Giving further guidance and commentary on practicing psalmody, he says that the person who sings the psalms must believe what they are singing, and that they must sing not with their voices, but with their hearts. He instructs that psalm singing should be used often for many purposes, so that the psalms might become personal prayers used for rising in the morning and going to sleep at night, in thanking God for food and drink, in bringing peace, forgiveness, and restoration, in combating fears and hardships, in easing work, in dying and mourning, and more. More information regarding his thoughts on responsorial psalmody will be given later in today's lecture. Praetorius's contemporaries set secular texts, but Praetorius did not. In SM1, he states that sacred music is more valuable than secular, and that he wants his music to serve the Christian faith. He states, quote, I trust that the talents turned away from the practice of secular art to a sacred use will begin to support and revere the ancient majesty of the Church's song and its majestic divinity and spiritual devotion with a praiseworthy results for religion, end quote. He answers the question, how important is worship music? With a poignant thought. The highest and ultimate goal that he, the human worshiper, has in common with the blessed angels consists on the one hand in searching for and getting to know the truth, and on the other in choosing virtue. The highest truth is close theologically through the knowledge of God, the highest virtue through celebrating God in true worship. To Praetorius, as he indicates, Worship is practicing the highest virtue, and this assigns great value to sacred musical compositions and performance. Further, he speaks at the heart of those entrusted to plan and prepare the liturgy, instructing that the liturgy must be pure and practiced with integrity. To those entrusted to plan and prepare the liturgy, he gives a warning to have motives that are true and right. 
quote, so God surely turns away from a liturgy put together without faith and penitence, carried out in impiety and, hip and hypocrisy, and accordingly he, stirred up with righteous indignation, casts man into eternal reformation and hides his face in silence, end quote. Jochen Arnold has presented, has presented an applicable question to consider. Does SM1 present a theology of music that is still valid today and may be acceptable to diverse denominations? The answer, in light of Pretorius' thought that singing and playing worship music is practicing the highest virtue, is yes. Pretorius' thought theology of music asserts that musical worship is of utmost significance, and this is foundational to the practice thereof in any era and in any denomination. Several other pieces of evidence reveal the faith of Praetorius. He created an acrostic based on his name, MPC, Michael Praetorius of Reisberg. To himself, these letters denoted the phrase, Miki Patra Chelu, Heaven is my fatherland. He was a devout father, follower of Luther and Augustine of Hippo, often quoting their writings and prayers, a Bible verse which greatly inspired Luther I will not die, but live and proclaim what the Lord has done for me, was important to Praetorius, who set this verse as a musical canon and commissioned it to be included on the title cover of his Musée ZNA 1 musical collection. He received an honorary appointment as prior of the monastery at Ringelheim, which he held until he died. Praetorius's heavenly visions are artistically realized on the title pages, printed pieces, of his musical collections. They feature pictorial images of the music making of angels and saints. These ink prints, made from hand carved woodcuts, were commissioned by Praetorius for his publications, who provided the iconography and texts that portrayed his visions and theology. Ulf Vellner proposes that these woodcuts illustrate Praetorius's devout nature and states, quote, the title woodcuts stand in a comprehensive context of Praetorian expression of faith, end quote. They include his signature motto, the acrostic MPC, Heaven is My Fatherland, and several scenes of heavenly and earthly worship. In the Polyhymnia Panegyrica title print, Praetorius is depicted kneeling before the cross of Christ with adjoining mottos that express his proclamation of faith, personal surrender, and devotion to Christ. The motto directly above the cross translates, My love is crucified. And the words inscribed on his left and right are, Give your servant the ability to die well if I am unlabeled, unable to live well, O Christ, you who are able to give both, and come to my aid, O Christ, in the throes of death. The cover of his Musée Zinni collection, which he reused for several other musical collections, displays this joint heaven and earth worship. Three heavenly vocal instrumental choirs worship in heaven, while at the same time, three earthly vocal and instrumental choirs worship below. Each group ex expresses distinct and particular words of worship. The various scenes, mottos, and symbols on the woodcuts give evidence of Praetorius' beliefs. The depth of his biblical knowledge and understanding is revealed in the many detailed images in the woodcut prints. In the Syntagma Musicum 1, he discusses many of these same biblical images. Those who personally knew Praetorius mentioned his strong faith. At his graveside burial, Preter, preacher Peter Tuckerman compared Praetorius to the biblical figure Jacob and testified of him. Quote, Jacob overcame everything through persistent faith, prayer, and patience. So the honorable music director also let these spiritual shields and weapons be entrusted to him, and I must give this testimonial. If there if ever there was a house in this area in which prayers were diligently said, truly it was his. End quote. A tribute at Pruteris' funeral stated, quote, to the pious departed Michael Praetorius Kreutzbergis, advocate, honorer, pillar of sacred music, now at the age of 49 years on February 15th of the year of Christ, 1621, his pious life ended by a pious death, end quote. Praetorius expresses his religious beliefs and faith in lengthy passages, lengthy prefaces to several of his collections, as well as in prefatory notes to some individual works. In the back of 15 of his Polyhymnia part books, he writes short devotionals and prayers. Some were self-composed and others were prayers of Augustine or other ancient theologians. These writings are varied in length, theme, and style, 
At the end of each one, he signs his name with a short statement of faith, including, Come Redeemer, Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ has redeemed us, or come to my aid in distress, Christ Jesus. A work that Praetorius did not complete, but referenced in SM1, is a six-part devotional series, Reignum Telorum, the Kingdom of Heaven. It includes thoughts and teachings on the Christian faith, scriptures, and various prayers. Praetorius biographer Willibald Gerlit has identified three capital settings with hymn texts written by Praetorius that are included in his Musaezania collection. These songs of repentance, or boost lead, provide a glimpse of Praetorius' intimate faith and understanding of the Christian life. The hymns, Ach, God, wem soll ich klagen? Mein Gott, mein Gott, o oh Vater mein, and Ach, wie weh ist mein Herzen, tell of his personal struggles with sin and the redemption he found in Jesus Christ. All three songs express suffering of soul and repentance with themes of sincere and simple faith. They are prayers that plead for God's encouragement and help. Ach, God wem soll ich klagen portrays a man who understands the depth of his own failures, yet acknowledges that he should trust Jesus in the words, He is my advocate, my intercessor. Praetorius acknowledges in the text that he does not feel, that he does not feel worthy that your lovely son has paid for me with his blood. He prays, quote, Be gracious, Lord, lead me in your ways, protect me from sin and shame, avert the blows of the devil with your hand, end quote. The second hymn, Ach, Vive est meinem Herzen, displays similar thoughts. He expresses deep suffering and distress of soul with the words, quote, My spirit is broken in me. Because of that, I cry out from the bottom of my heart to you, dear God, and pray to you with bitter pain, hear my cry. End quote. The third hymn, Mein Gott, O Vater mein, offers firstly a prayer that he will live a holy life, and secondly a prayer for the time of his death. The hymn closes with a mention of worshiping alongside the angels. Regarding his life, he prays, quote, Grant me a constant hope and a life blessed by God, humility, patience, purity, truth alongside Christian love. Money, property, and honor I don't desire, only with grace you turn towards me. Let me see your goodness. Give me a strong, firm, pure faith through the power of your spirit for comfort of my grieving inner being. End quote. Regarding his death, he prays, quote, Lastly, when the hour is present, let my soul be in your hands. Release me from the devil's bonds. Push his deceit and might far away from me and take me with grace to you. Let me go in peace. Amen. I will praise and worship forever with a multitude of angels. End quote. These personal hymn texts reveal a dependence on and hope in God. Praetorius used a number of compositional techniques typical to those of his day to musically express his religious beliefs. His works feature both Latin and German languages. He said only sacred texts composing many settings and harmonizations of Lutheran chorales. Many of his works feature polychoral techniques with two, three, four, or even five choirs. His works are highly adaptable. For example, he instructs, leave out a part, or use the forces that are available, or instruments and voices often may be used interchangeably in performing individual parts in his works. Echo features are common. He creates sound variations through spacing techniques by separating the performing forces. As is common to music in this genre and era, the rhythmic meters are partially irregular as the tactic, as the tactus supports the text. Praetorius repeatedly commented that hearing and understanding the text is foundational to his compositions. In some passages, choral declamation is used to bring a clear delivery of the text. He switches frequently between duple and triple meter in conveying the emotion of the text. A brief shift into triple meter characterizes rejoicing and celebration. Alternati, or alternation, techniques Echo features and Ritornello will, will be displayed in the three pieces performed today. Two of these pieces are Lutheran chorale adaptations from the Polyhymnia Conduciatrix at Panagyrica collection, which is translated as the peacemaking and celebratory polyhymnia containing solemn concertos of peace and joy. The third piece in today's performance is, is one of the four 
is one of the four of Praetorius's freely composed psalm texts. The article on Praetorius in Grove Music Online describes his music as exemplifying the height of alternati, which features a musical dialogue portrayed through alternation, echo effects, and various contrasts that are similar to spoken dialogue. His settings of responsorial psalmody in both Latin and German display this musical dialogue style. Praetorius's use of the alternating style seems to stem from three influences. First, the responsorial, responsorial psalmody tradition of the Roman Catholic Church, which has its foundations in Old Testament practice. In SM1, Praetorius discusses this call response or dialogue format. Some of the psalm verses are written in couplet form. The first half is a type of call, and the second half is a type of response. The first half makes a statement, which is affirmed in the second half. The dialogue is sometimes also in question-answer form. For example, from Psalm 121, 1, Part A, I lift up my eyes to the hills, where does my help come from? The answer is Part B, my help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. The second influence was the new and popular Cori Spazzati style of the Italians. Choirs were separated within a performance space, which was initially a cathedral. Praetorius creatively features elements of Antiphony and Cori Spazzati in several combinations. For example, the choral and choral instrumental groups alternate phrase by phrase or verse by verse, and the ritornello is used as a type of alternation at times. The third and most noteworthy influence was the religious imagery drawn from his own personal Christian faith. As a writer of sacred music, he viewed his worship music as a replication of the angel choirs in heaven singing around the throne of God. Praetorius tried to recreate this scenario in the Lutheran church. In the writings of Michael Praetorius, the theme of joint worship of God by angels and men is prevalent in the writings. In his writings. In the preface to his Megalonodia collection, he says, It is very lovely and charming to hear when the complete assembly is joined by choirs and organs, dramatizing as it were how it will be in heaven when the angels and saints of God will join with us in intoning and singing the Sanctus 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 Gloria in Excelsis Deo. On the woodcut print that serves as the title page for Musée ZNA, Praetorius depicts this joint worship of men and angels playing and singing together in antiphonal style. The woodcut depicts a call and response pattern or dialogue. Please see figure one. Here, Praetorius directs earthly worshipers as they join with heavenly worshipers. According to Praetorius, what dialogues are is familiar to everyone. A dialogue means a conversation. In declaring Psalm 94 verse 1, a verse in couplet form, the left balcony singers and musicians offer, Venite exultemus Deo, Deo, come let us exalt in the Lord. And the right side balcony section responds with, Jubilemus Deo salutari, salutari nostro, let us shout joyfully to God our Savior. A vertical dimension of antiphony is, an, is additionally depicted in the phrase Plenty suit shaley et terra gloria tua, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Angels in the heavens above are joined by the men on earth below. The, the divided text is pictorially described. The word shaley, heaven, corresponds to the angels, and terra, earth, to the men. Praetorius explains that the alternative style is the correct way to make music because it was modeled by the angels. Quote, particularly though, I have wanted to use this title, Urania, because the sort for choirs to sing is in truth the correct heavenly way to make music. Insomuch as Isaiah, the sacred and distinguished prophet and man of God, testifies in chapter six of his prophecy, verses one to four. In this Bible passage, Isaiah the prophet sees a vision of angels worshiping God as he is seated on his heavenly throne. Quote, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the end of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. End quote. 
In Luther's Deutsche Messe, the traditional chorale, the Sayyid and Prophet is used as a German substitute for the Psalms. The original tune and text, a word for word rendering of the biblical passage just presented, was written by Martin Luther and is known in English as Isaiah, Mighty Seer in Days of Old. Please listen to one of our choristers sing part of the chorale in its traditional form. Yes, I had them prophet and das geschah. Das der im Geist den Herren sitzen sah, auf einem hohen Thron in hellen Glanz, seines Kleides Saum den Chor fühlet ganz. Es stunden Sven sehr auf bei ihm daran, Sechs Flügel sah er einen jeden Hahn, mit Sven verborgen sie ihr Antlitz klar, mit Sven bedeckten sie die Füße gar. Praetorius transfigured this simple hymn into a chorale concerto, portraying the wondrous scene of angels calling across the expanse of the sky in variations of three different melodic, rhythmic, and harmonic settings with a proclamation of the words, Heilig ist Gott der Herre Zebaut, Holy is the Lord God of the Sabbath. The term holy is defined by Miriam Webster as exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness, with the root de derived from the word whole. The verb calling implies a present continuous act. The seraphim were actively worshiping God on his throne by attributing holiness to him, proclaiming his perfection with a Trisagian declaration, holy, holy, holy. The first angel call, a short and simple tuneful melody is sung three times and set three ways with unique and creative choral effects. The boys' choir, the treble choir, is assigned to present the theme the very first time. Please listen to musical example number two. One can envision the sound of loud echoing in the expanse of heavens resulting from the angel calls. Praetorius uses echoes in the singer and instrumental parts to replicate this heavenly echoing. The singers on earth, imitating the angels in heaven, call out to one another in alternating fashion and are intentionally placed in opposing positions in an enclosed acoustic space, as Praetorius directed. These specific indications in shaping the sound of some proclamations and echoes resemble the heavenly worship as depicted in both Isaiah chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 4. Please listen to the choir sing musical example number three, which presents a second high league theme in triple time, and musical example number four, the lively third and longer high league is squatched to Hera theme in double time. Lord God of the Sabbath, Praetorius created a pattern which ascends by whole steps in major chords, which bears resemblance to a fanfare, indicating a royal presence. Please listen to musical example number five. Praetorius uses a repeating musical phrase, a type of ritornello, in accentuating the text, Sein er die ganze Welt erfüllt hat, the earth is full of his glory. The entire ensemble of 16 parts all loudly join together to bring emphasis and grandeur to the proclamation of the text. 
The delivery is greatly slowed and the rhythm is more unified. Please listen to our choir sing musical example number six. The same music is also presented twice with grandeur and boldness to the final text phrase of the piece. The text, however, is different this time. This substitute chorale for the Sanctus adds an additional text verse from the Isaiah 6 passage. Quote, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. End quote. Why did Praetorius set these words to the same powerful music? He offers his theological insight to the text. The shaking of the thresholds and beams and the filling of the temple with smoke that was caused by the angel calls also express the glory of God. Please listen to our choir sing musical example seven. Number four from Polyhymnia Conduciatrix is a German substitute for the Agnus Dei in the Lutheran Mass. The text was written by Nicolas Decius in 1531. Please listen to one of our choristers present the traditional chorale. Musical example number eight. Again, Praetorius transforms a simple, familiar chorale text and tune into an intimate, expressive chorale concerto, sensitively depicting the innocent Lamb of God who was slaughtered, geschlachtet, on the cross. The setting is for four treble boys plus choir. The boys are separated and positioned around the church, highlighting the echo effects. Praetorius instructs, Four boys must be put in four separate places in the church, opposite each other, or wherever it is convenient. The musical lines alternate through the four boy choir parts. The first boy opens by singing the familiar tune in a slow-moving solo, which projects an innocence and vulnerability. The passage depicts the innocence of the Lamb of God who was slaughtered on the cross. Please listen to one of the boy choir soloists to sing musical example number nine. Thank you. Depicting the Embarma dich in Unze, oh, be merciful to us, section from Olam. Three boy parts echo one by one an exact melodic and rhythmic repetition which invite the listener to envision a picture of the suffering Christ on the cross and to consider the personal, the personal meaning of this act. The slow text declamation in this descending melodic passage with three melodic echoes invite reflection and gravity. The echo effect may also depict a cry or echoing in the distance. Because of the positioning of the boys, the musical phrase traveling around the performance space may represent a universal plea for God's mercy. The setting proclaims the profound act of Jesus' death with its significance in both earthly and heavenly realms. Please listen to the boy choir sing musical example number 10.
As in several other chorales dating to this time, Praetorius concludes the piece with the Kyrie eleison as a concluding refrain following the pattern of the Leise, a German devotional song dating back to the 9th century. The stanza is concluded with both the Kyrie eleison as well as the Christe eleison. Please listen to example number 11. <laughs> Mirli, commissioned by Burkhard Grossmann as part of a collection of Psalm 116 settings, Angst der Hellen und Friede der Seelen, Anguish of Hell and Peace of Soul, is one of the four freely set psalmotet settings of Praetorius. Its personal significance is that Praetorius considered it to be his swan song or farewell. Grossmann explains, quote, the late author of Herod Praetorius, in transmitting this song, also provided a detailed ordinance and several variations indicating how he wanted the same performed. He also sent me a most moving and ingenuous, ingenuous, ingenuous letter in which he writes that he composed this song not only in friendly compliance with my Christian request, but also as his own farewell and thereby wanted to take his leave. End quote. Das ist mir lieb, Psalm 116, is divided into three textual sections and is composed for five voices, S-A-T-T-B, and five stringed instruments. The instrumental forces are used in two ways. First, in short sym symphonias that invite contemplation occurring before each of the three sections. Second, in doubling the voice parts with the designated instruments, violin, three violas, and cello, that add emphasis or enhancement to specific texts. The work is a portrayal of a, of a life of faith, contrasting seasons of anguish and pain with renewal of joy and thankfulness. The author of Psalm 116 describes his earthly life through descriptions of searching for God, suffering agony during times of waiting for him in the depths, and ultimately through finding him and experiencing peace because of God's faithfulness. Praetorius had walked through many challenges and hardships himself and identified with the struggle of life's journey. As the psalm verses and phrases alternate between sorrow and joy, coupled with anxiety and confidence, Praetorius' music follows this pattern. In accommodating a clear and expressive delivery of the sacred text, a metrical rhythm gives way to speech song. Clarity of text is key to Praetorius. In this regard, he explains, quote, The vocalist must then pronounce the words and syllables clearly and carefully, so that the text can be clearly and exactly heard and understood by the hearers. End quote. The setting of each scriptural verse has its own affect. Cadential breaks after each section and phrase separate the themes and ideas. Choral recitative style is used to provide clarity to solemn texts and is contrasted with faster triple meter sections for affirming texts that evoke a joyful, hopeful response. Praetorius uses imitated polyphony with short descending repeated repeating motives and minor scalar runs to represent insistent and desperate cries or pleas for help. Tension is created through suspensions in both instrumental and vocal lines. Clashing harmonies, deceptive cadences, and slow moving tempos prolong the feeling of unrest. The many repeated desperate pleas of O Herr, Aretta Mina Zela, O Lord, save my soul, and O Herr, O Lord, create a picture of an anxious and troubled man looking for relief. Praetorius instructs instrumentalists not to double the vocal lines in this passage, possibly to lay greater weight to the context of the text as declaimed by the singers. Please listen to our choir sing musical example number 12. Oh, Praetorius is able to use this psalm to tell his own story as he sums up his life on earth. He proclaims that he has been saved and rescued by God and is now ready to join him in heaven according to verse 16 of the psalm, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. 
Praetorius sets this section using slow, overlapping phrases with major tonalities to express a feeling of peaceful confidence. As one means of personalizing the setting, he repeats and emphasizes specific texts either directly in alternation or in echo. He confidently declares, Ich bin dein Knecht, I am your servant, through many repetitions in each of the voices. The short motivic figure uses a descending melodic line that depicts an attitude of humility and service. Please listen as our choir sings musical example number 13. <laughs> The psalm concludes with the declaration, I will proclaim the goodness of God in the courts of the house of the Lord. Praetorius uses a multi-echo technique in setting this text, which gives a heavenly impression, implying that the words will carry further than the present space and time. These loud, soft indications bring distinction to the texts in the course, in the courts, in der, in der Hofmann, and in the house of the Lord, am Hause des Herren. The use of echoes gives a three-dimensional musical, port musical portrayal of the significance that extends to a different world. It is a performance instruction. He notes that the echoes, echoes can be performed by the vocalist singing quietly or performed solely by the instruments. In today's presentation, the instruments will provide the echoes in this passage. Please listen to our choir and instrumentalists to present musical example number 14. <laughs> The subsequent hallelujahs are also set with echoes, which serve as a retronello. They give a picture of an eternal resounding in the heavens from the angels and saints. The triple meter paired with the hallelujah text signifies a joyful end after overcoming many trials. This section symbolizes a testimony and proclamation of faith that will ring out for generations and even into eternity. Please listen to musical example number 15. Analysis of these three works in light of Praetorius' teaching on worship and his expressed desire to join the heavenly choir suggests that his faith was the driving force of his life on earth. His musical ideas and decisions express this faith. This influence is a defining element of past and present musical worship in the Christian church. Additionally, it is an encouragement for Christians through the generations to set their hearts and thoughts alongside the worshiping angels in looking toward their installation into the everlasting choir, as did Praetorius. At this time, I would like to recognize and thank the members of my doctoral committee, Dr. John Brobeck, Dr. Elizabeth Schauer, and Dr. Jay Rosenblatt, who have generously used their musical and technical writing skills to support me in this degree. I was able to take multiple classes with these professors and learned a great deal from each of them. Dr. Brobeck, Thank you especially for being willing to chair my committee. Although you carry a heavy load in teaching, in administrating, in performing and directing, you give generously of your time to support me. I have a deep respect and admiration for you and the work you do at the University of Arizona. I'm thankful for all three of my committee members. I would also like to recognize Praetorius scholar Dr. Margaret Boudreau, who guided me in learning about Michael Praetorius. Dr. Boudreau, you have faithfully invested into, into my life with great generosity. I am indebted to you. I thank Pastor Nathan Biebert for all he shared with me. I thank the singers and instrumentalists who extended themselves to perform in this recital. Above all, I thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for, the enabling, for, for enabling me to pursue this degree and helping me to complete it. 
May the life and work of Michael Praetorius continue to bring glory to God in this generation and in future years. Thank you.
Oh, oh.